says the other option is that you can have your mother-in-law buried here in Israel for about $150. Well, the man without hesitation says, we are shipping her back to Canada. And the funeral director was quite moved by this and thought, wow, you, you, you must really love your mother-in-law an incredible amount. He goes, no, actually, I couldn't stand the woman. The funeral director said, well, then why are you spending the extra almost $5,000 the man says, well, I'm not sure if it's true or not, but I heard 2,000 years ago there was a man who lived in Israel. There was a man who then died in Israel. There was a man who then was buried in Israel, and on the third day he rose again. And whether it's true or not, I can't take that chance. Some of you got there before I could. But as we think about Easter, as we think about the resurrection of Jesus, I think the reality is, for different people, we come to it from different places. I'm sure there are many of you here this morning that as we gather, we celebrate the reality of the resurrection. We, we celebrate the, the belief that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is the one who died, and then on the third day, he rose again. But then there also may be people here this morning who, as funny as the story is, can relate more to that place than to the place of belief. You know, we've, we've heard the story, we, we understand the details, but we're not really sure if it's true. And even if it is true, ultimately, what difference will it make in our life? I would suggest this morning that if you're at a place of doubt and uncertainty, that you would actually line up closer to the reality of what those on that first Easter were experiencing. I mean, we just read a passage from John's Gospel of, of one of Jesus' disciples, a, a man who was with Jesus not for weeks, not for months, but for years, a man who had heard Jesus teach, a man who had seen Jesus perform incredible miracles, but a man who also watched Jesus die. Thomas. And he had a hard time believing that Jesus had actually risen. Even after his friends, those who also had spent not weeks, not months, but years with Jesus, had come to him one night and had said, Thomas, Thomas, we have wonderful news. We have fantastic news. We have seen Jesus. He has risen. And Thomas wasn't all suddenly excited or jumping up and down and thinking, I knew it, I knew it. Thomas is like, no, I don't believe. Unless I see it for myself, Unless I see his hands, unless I see his side, I will not believe. And as a result, Thomas has been known historically as the one who doubts. Maybe you've said it or maybe you've heard it said of yourself. You know, when someone tells you something and you say, ah, no, I don't, I don't really believe it. Unless I see it, I don't believe it. They may call you a doubting Thomas. I mean, historically, what a bad rap. But if you go back into the story, you realize that Thomas really shouldn't be heaped on as much as he should have. I mean, simply back it up a little bit, and you see the other ten disciples who went and told Thomas with great excitement and enthusiasm after they had seen Jesus, they, they weren't ones who really believed as well. Because what were they doing after Jesus had been crucified? They had locked themselves up in a room in fear and trembling as to what was going to happen next. Now, I'm no psychologist, but if you're locking yourself up in a room out of fear of what's going to happen to you, you're likely not believing in the fact that Jesus, the one you just saw being crucified, is actually going to rise again. And, and so they too obviously doubted. You back it up a little bit further in the story, and you see the women that when they went to the tomb on the third day, they didn't go with the sense of, we are going to see the risen Lord, we are going to see the empty tomb. No, no, they went to prepare Jesus' body for the proper burial. 
And when they showed up to the tomb and they noticed the stone had been rolled away and the tomb was empty, they didn't get all excited and start thinking, yes, it is true, Jesus has risen. No, they were overcome with grief and sadness, trying to find a gardener to say, you know, where where has the body of Jesus been taken? And so what we see in the reality of Thomas was actually a lived out experience for most of those followers of Jesus, those who were so close to Jesus, those the ones that Jesus had told them, listen, listen, we're going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be handed over to the authorities. I am going to be beaten. I'm going to be crucified. But get this. On the third day, I will rise again. And Jesus didn't say it once. It's recorded three times in the Bible. The likelihood is Jesus said it more times than that, yet the disciples did not believe. You know, there's many things that we can take out of the resurrection. But I think one of the great gifts that we see in this story is the fact that Jesus meets us where we are at. You notice the women were filled with a sense of, 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 of grief and sadness, and Jesus met them there. The disciples were overwhelmed with a sense of fear, and Jesus met them there. Thomas was at a place of doubt when he says, unless I see the hands, unless I touch the side, I will not believe, and Jesus met him there. When he went to Thomas and said, see, look at my hands. See, touch my side. He says, stop doubting and believe. One of the great realities of Jesus in being God is that he reminds us that God meets us where we are at. It's in many ways the the MO of Jesus. I mean, if you even start backing it up, the story even more, I'm not sure how familiar you may be with the Bible, but if you back it up to the actual day when Jesus was crucified, there was two criminals being crucified as well, being executed because of the, the, the sins that they had committed. And there was one criminal who was heaping insults upon Jesus, wanted nothing to do with Jesus, but the other one saw something in Jesus. And so he said to him, Will will you remember me? And Jesus met him where he was at, in the midst of his sin, in the midst of his failure, in the midst of a sur and certain death. Jesus says, today, 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 you will be with me in paradise. Back it up even further into John chapter 8, and there's there's this story where the religious leaders, the one who really didn't like Jesus and ultimately led him to his death, they, they, they found this woman who was caught in adultery. You know, a couple side notes is like, I mean, they just brought the woman, not the man, but they brought the woman to Jesus, and according to their law and their custom, she was to be stoned to death. And so they think they got Jesus on this one. They've painted him into a corner. And and so they say to Jesus, you know, this woman has committed adultery. You know, the the law says we should stone her. (laughs) What what, what do you say? And Jesus takes his time on this. And he says, you know what? Anyone who is without sin, no one else here messed up, you throw the first stone. And then Jesus starts drawing in the sand. Well, one after another, people start dropping stones and the whole crowd disappears. And then Jesus looks at the woman and says, where's everyone gone? Has, Has no one condemned you? And then Jesus says, then neither do I condemn you, but go and sin no more. The reality is this. Jesus doesn't simply meet us where we are, but he does so with a desire to not leave us there for long. He meets us where we are in order to bring transformation into our life. The disciples were were filled with a sense of fear, and Jesus met them there and brought them to a place of courage. The the women were were overwhelmed with grief and sadness and brought them to a place of joy. Thomas was at a place of doubt and disbelief. 
And Jesus brought him to a place of belief. It's incredible as you begin to to see the reality of who Jesus is. You begin to see the hope of Easter is that it is God coming to us. To meet us where we are. So that our lives when we believe in him can truly be changed and transformed. It's actually a theme that, that John picks up on. It's the last two verses that we read here this morning. And it's in John chapter 20. And if you want to turn there again, it's on page 115 on these blue Bibles in front of you. And in verse 30 and 31, John says something that I think is an incredible takeaway. Because it tells us why we read the Bible in the first place. Why we have the Bible. Because John is on to something. And he's wanting to make sure that everyone gets it. He says in verse 30, he says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. And so you can take a step away and think, okay, Jesus did a lot of other things as well that that are not included in what we hold on to as the Bible, but we have enough. And Jesus then goes on to tell us why we read the Bible, why the Bible was given to us in the first place. In verse 31, John says, but these are written, these stories are written, so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. Why why do we read the Bible? Why do, we, why do we walk the Bible in every Sunday and then, and then walk it out following the service as well? It's so that we will be reminded that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Son of God, not just so we have this head knowledge, but so that when we believe in Him, we will truly have life. Have life in Him. And, 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 and we begin to see just the reality of this. I mean, because think about it for a moment. Like, why would some of these stories be included in the Bible? I don't know if you read the Bible a lot or a little, but it doesn't take too long once you start reading it to realize that there are some messed up individuals in the Bible. Yet God not only meets them in the mess, he can oftentimes use them if they are willing to do incredible things. I mean, I mean, why would Jesus, why would the story be told that Jesus has a group of followers that are dedicated and devoted to him, but then on one of the most important teachings and realities of his resurrection, nobody gets it? Because we see the honesty of life, and we see the greater reality of Jesus wanting to meet us where we are so that we'll begin to see who Jesus is as the Messiah, as the Son of God. Why is Easter so important? Because everything stands or falls on it. Jesus himself said that that everything is going to be validated by the fact that he will rise on the third day. Everything that was spoken about Jesus hundreds of years earlier was all going to be validated on if Jesus rose on the third day. I mean, the early followers knew this, and they realized that if Jesus didn't rise, then this whole Christianity thing is all smoke and mirrors. It's not worth it. But if Jesus did rise, then not only is he the Son of God, but that we can have life in him as well. Why Easter? Because it reminds us that in Jesus, we have life, we have hope, and we have purpose. A hope that no matter what, God is at work in our life. A hope that no matter what happens to us, not only in life, but ultimately even in death, God is in control. And it gives us purpose. A purpose where suddenly life is lived not only with Jesus, but for Jesus. 
we begin to follow in his ways, begin to understand that when Jesus offered life, he knew the best way to live. And so when he teaches us and he asks us to follow him, it's in order that we truly live this abundant life with him. And so my question for all of us here today is where? Where are you at? And do you believe that Jesus will meet you there? If you're someone who believes in Jesus, someone who understands the resurrection, are you living with that sense of hope and purpose? Is Easter an everyday reality in your life? Do people see the hope of Jesus living in and through you? Are, are you able to meet others who, who may not be in the same place of belief? Are you able to meet them and accept them in the same way that Jesus does? Because let's be honest, too often as a church, we, we can get this wrong. We, we think that people have to act and behave and pretty themselves up in a certain way before they can be presented to God. It's just not the truth. Jesus says, come as you are. I will meet you there and allow me to bring change and transformation into your life. And so as people who believe, are we living in that way? Or perhaps this morning you're, you're someone who, who lands more on the side of doubt and disbelief. A doubt can be manifested in a number of ways. Doubt that perhaps is based on a wonder of, can Jesus really meet me where I'm at? You know, I've made mistakes, I've got a past, I've got a bit of a present, you know, Take one of these Bibles home with you. Our gift to you. They're better in your home, in your hands, than in these pews. Take them home and begin just reading through the Gospel of John. And begin to see how Jesus meets people where they are, and so he most certainly can meet you where you're at as well. Don't, don't take my word for it. Read it for yourself. And begin to see this transformation that can begin to take place. Maybe you're still a little uncertain and you have questions and you have doubts and, and, and you're, you're, you're skeptical. It's a great place to be. Continue to ask those questions. I would be more than happy to, to have that conversation with you. You know, I, I said it earlier in the service. If you want to fill out one of those cards, I would love to meet you where you're at. Not, not in this building, but where you're most comfortable. At a pub, at a coffee house wherever it takes to have a conversation about Jesus because I believe that he brings life, ultimate life, not only in the difficulties that we face, but in the midst of even our success so that we can have ultimate satisfaction in all of life because that's what Jesus wants for us. One final thing to consider is coming back and joining us on Sunday mornings. Why we gather here in this place at this time is because we want to celebrate the reality of not only who Jesus is, not only what Jesus has done, but what that means for us in our life. And so starting next Sunday, we're going we're to start a new series called Growing in Christ. And it's a series that is being created for both believers and, and people who have doubts and questions. For those of us who believe, it's an opportunity for us to go a little bit deeper in, in understanding how can I grow my relationship with Jesus so that it goes beyond a Sunday morning and begins to hit the ground running in everything I do. For some of you, those that, that may doubt and are still not quite certain, join us because we're going to work through some of what I believe are the primary ways that Jesus steps into our life. Some of them are obvious. Some of them are less so. As a church here in Paris, our hope is that we want to lead people to Jesus because he is the one who brings life. He is the one who brings hope. He is the one who gives us a future. And so we understand that everybody's welcome because nobody's perfect. Yet anything is possible because of Jesus.
Please stand as we sing together.